Greetings! Today we're going to talk about the fall of higher education, the Vietnam theory, the pursuit of adulation over knowledge. First, I want to get into a little bit of intellectuals in society because this is kind of the backdrop for the context of this. Um, Thomas Sowell has a fantastic book called Intellectuals in Society. The audiobook is great too if you want to check it out. It goes into great detail of how intellectuals throughout history have been often wrong and faced no consequences. So in order to get into my theory, I need a framework. And so we're going to use Soul's framework on what an intellectual is. Um, he has a more narrow definition of an intellectual, which is someone whose work begins and ends with ideas, whose success is measured by the adulation of one's peers, and someone who suffers no consequences for being wrong. So that's where you get into the whole university professor. You know, you could think of another type of intellectual, um, for example, an architect who has an intellectual knowledge, he designs a building, but if the building happens to fall apart, he will suffer consequences. He will no longer get any work and possibly get sued. But these type of intellectuals, intellectuals in the social sciences and academia that suffer absolutely no consequences for being wrong, how they gain recognition and respect is measured through the adulation from their peers, through a system called peer review. They write articles, other professors read it, they say it's great, and they use it in citations for their other crackpot theories, and it's a, it's a, just a bubble of ignorance. If you go to the uh, Real Peer Review Twitter feed, you can see some of the worst examples of peer-reviewed articles and peer-reviewed research that uh, you've probably paid for in part through your taxes of just absolute nonsense. And again, in higher, ac in higher academics, in higher education, you really don't suffer any consequences for being wrong about your ideas. You get all the reward in the world for regurgitating or espousing crazy views that your colleagues have grown to appreciate. And that's the whole world of academic tenure. You can't get fired for espousing terrible ideas. So this channel is about economics and economics is a data-driven science. And while economics has historically been branched with philosophy because if you go back far enough there was no accurately recorded data people weren't tracking things like unemployment rates and prices and and salary indexes and all these good things um it was just a bunch of philosophers pontificating about ideas they had that kind of made sense to them there was nothing wrong with that at the time but as you get into today's world where we do have accurate data, economists can both validate and disprove theories. Um, however, this marriage with the social sciences continues and it isn't the best fit because economists at universities have to deal with these other, um, these other professors in the social sciences that, that have strange thinking and they don't want conflict, they don't want strife, so they just, shrug their shoulders and walk along and are often very quiet about how they really feel. Our good friend Thomas Sowell, I think, sums it up perfectly. The things that they thought were going to help did not help, and in many cases, made things much worse. One of the things that I found out that was sort of amazing about your history, you, you briefly mentioned it right before we started, you were a Marxist at one time in your life. Most people will find this hard to believe, but it is true. But it's not that unusual. Uh, most of the, the leading conservative thinkers of our ta time uh, did not start off as conservative. You got a couple like uh, Bill Buckley and uh, George Will. But I mean, Milton Friedman was a liberal and a Keynesian. Ronald Reagan was so far left, at one point the FBI was following him. Do you remember sort of what you were thinking, what appealed to you at that time about Marxism? Yes, I mean, there was no alternative being discussed. Uh, my first job was as a Western Union messenger. And uh, I would come home on some nights, I would take the Fifth Avenue bus, which cost all of 15 cents in those days. <laughs> but I figured I'd splurge now and then. 
and I would drive, it would go all the way up Fifth Avenue past all these Lord and Taylor and uh, all these fancy uh, places. And then I'd cross 57th Street past Carnegie Hall and down Riverside Drive, and that was the, the, sort of the Gold Coast area. And then the, as I came across this long viaduct and that turned into 135th Street, suddenly there were the tenements. And I wondered, why is this? I mean, it's so, it's so, it's so different. And, and nothing in the schools or in most of the books uh, seemed to deal with that. And Marx dealt with that. Uh, so it's, it's, it's like winning an election when there's only one person running. So then what was your wake up to what was wrong with that line of thinking? Uh, facts. <laughs> well, you know, we could probably end the interview right there. Yeah, facts, yeah, there you and, go. And, yeah. and, so Thomas really just hit the nail on the head. Um, you know, Marx was right about a couple things, but as we know, he was deadly wrong about others. And it wasn't until we have hard facts and data that we can correlate with economic theory to really validate what works and what doesn't. And um, so where does this go into higher education? Where did we go wrong? So in Thomas Sowell's book, Intellectuals in Society, he goes over a long history of where intellectuals have been dead wrong about so many things and paid no consequence for it. And there have been terrible outcomes. But in my Vietnam War theory, which is not in his book, uh, this is something I've seen play out uh, in decades of experience in higher education. And during the Vietnam War, there were a number of students who normally would have, upon graduating high school, not wanted to go into higher education, not want the academic life, but they found themselves enrolling simply because they wanted to avoid the draft. And that was an exemption. If you were in, uh, enrolled in a college or university, you didn't have to be drafted to war. You were, you were uh, deferred from that. So you had this situation where you had these very kind-hearted professors, well-intentioned, who passed along students who normally would have been washed out, who would have flunked out, or who would have been discouraged to even continue the, you know, just very mediocre performance and saying, hey, you know, you could probably do better in life if you did something else. And what that did was create this cycle of decline in critical thinking and reason, where you have this soft-headed, you know, very um, left of center thinking professor who espouses ideas, they get transferred to a student who doesn't fully even understand them or comprehend them or even know the, the limits of those ideas and what they can, what they can actually accomplish. And that student winds up staying in the academic world. Uh, instead of upon graduating their, from their undergrad degree and going out and getting a job, a lot of them had this idea like, hey, I don't want a blue collar life. I want to work in the white collar world. But they were never that type of person. And they couldn't get hired in such a, such a situation. So what do they do? They stay in the university system and they wind up getting PhDs and they wind up keep getting passed along because of this whole Vietnam War thing. And they wind up becoming our next generation of professors, a lower caliber of thinker, a thinker that's attracted to some of these more radical ideas, and they train the next generation of students without any critical thinking, without any reason. So this, this generation of professors not only continues to train the next generation of professors, but trains people to go out into the world and do other things, goes out into Congress, goes out into our media, espousing radical, crazy ideas without having any sense of what they do, not understanding incentives and constraints. And it's just this continual cycle of degradation, of decline. Murray Rothbard said, it's no crime to be ignorant of economics, which is after all a specialized discipline and one that most people consider to be a dismal science. 
but it's totally irresponsible to have a loud and voiceless opinion on economic subjects while remaining in this state of ignorance. And economics is, by all means, a dismal science. There are trade-offs. There is no pie-in-the-sky solution that's going to take care of everybody. But people like this think there is. And if you try and say there are incentives and constraints, if you try to say there are real consequences to good-hearted policies that have terrible outcomes, you're vilified. So our good friend Jordan Peterson now believes we're at the state of such decline that it's better just not to even go to college. Well, it's just so strange that these sort of courses and these sort of ide ideologies are thriving in universities. And it's really disconcerting to someone who has children. Mm -hmm. And you know that your children are going to go there and they're going to be exposed them to, trade to these school. ideas. You know, I think I think that wow, I think a that guy the used to teach at Harvard just says send him to trade school. I think the universities, <laughs> I, I think the universities, I think you can make a reasonable case that the universities do more harm than good now. I wow. hate to say that the university, which is like the repository of human wisdom and the attempt to expand that may have already moved outside the universities. You know, just because an institution calls itself a university doesn't mean it is. And many disciplines have turned into ideological factories. And so where's the university? I mean, the university is where, where anyone wants to learn about their culture and where anyone wants to expand the domain of human competence. And a lot of that's happening online now. Jordan makes a great point. You're here online learning something that you see is of value to you. So what we're finding out today there's a very interesting gender gap in college enrollment. It's about 60% women and 40% men. The men are more and more deciding not to go into college. They are deciding to pick up skills in the workforce and pick up skills online, just like Jordan Peterson was talking about. Uh, just about anything you need to learn, you can learn online and use those skills to your advantage. Uh, women are staying in college instead of out there earning and making themselves more attractive in the marketplace for jobs. They are getting degrees like gender studies and social justice oriented classes and things like this. Um, and also winding up with a lot of debt. It's very interesting to see how this is going to play out and what the next generation will look like if this trend continues to skew like this. Uh, have some very interesting links in the description, uh, not only about this, but all the other topics we've been talking about today. Another thing I want to bring up about the decline of colleges is the ranking system. For some reason, U.S. News & World Report has become the end-all, be-all authority of what makes a great college and who has the best college. Sadly, their rankings have very little to do with academic excellence, what's being taught, academic rigor. They value things on like what other deans think of your institution. Very subjective. Um, how, what percentage of the alumni give back to the school? Uh, how many students wind up in debt? Well, that's a personal choice. That's, that's the student's choice. It's, it has nothing to do with what type of education the college is providing. So it's very misleading to, to see this report. And sadly, universities are chasing after these rankings and leaving behind the nuts and bolts and tried and true methods of educating a student. One last note I want to leave off on about this Vietnam War theory. Had we only listened to Milton Friedman earlier, Milton Friedman is largely responsible for ending the draft in the United States. Had we only listened to him sooner, we may be in a different stage of the decline of higher education. We may even be in a better place. We just don't know. Um, there are so many things in his landmark book, Capitalism and Freedom. If we followed today, we would be in a much better place. I encourage you to read it. Uh, I also have a link for The Power of Choice. It goes into detail about what role Milton Friedman did play in ending the draft in Vietnam. I certainly do feel we would be in a much worse place if it was not ended. So please leave me a comment. Let me know what you think of my theory on the Vietnam War and how it 
played a role in declining higher education in the U.S. Um, because of you guys, because of your subscriptions, I'm able to say things that I could never say in the world of higher education. I'm able to be frank and honest with you, and I appreciate your support, your great comments, the great conversations that are happening in the, uh, in the chat. It's fantastic. Please subscribe and share. Let's get to 100,000 views. Another great way you can support this channel is if you have the Brave browser, I'm sure you're concerned about your privacy and like all those tracking things blocked. Uh, Brave is great. Don't have any compatibility issues. And you earn basic attention tokens. Instead of Google making all that advertising revenue, you earn the revenue. You can use those tokens to turn them into cash. Uh, turn them into Bitcoin, whatever you like, or you can send me a little tip by clicking on this triangle up here if you have the Brave browser installed. Have some great referral links. I can't say enough how much I love that American Express Amazon Prime card. You get $125 once you're approved. It takes about 10 minutes. Don't have to even spend a dollar on the card. It just is immediately deposited into your Amazon account. $10 in Bitcoin from Coinbase, two free stocks from Webull, and $90 on deposits from Celsius Network in Bitcoin. Okay, thanks again, everyone. Please leave your comments, subscribe, like, share, do all those good things, and I'll see you on the next one.